Thank you very much, and here is Meg. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is wonderful that you guys all came. Um, I let's see. I think I'll start by explaining a little bit about Imogen. She, Imogen was my grandmother. Um, it was quite an entertainment to be <laughs> in a family of photographers. Uh, Dorothea Lang was my godmother. My dad, Ron Partridge, was also a full-time photographer for 75 years. So I grew up in, amongst you know, the, the world of photography and um, realized other people at about the age seven or eight didn't have all of these wild and crazy familial relationships, <laughs> but it took me a while. <laughs> um, so, so this was very familiar territory um, in my young life to, to be uh, running uh, across the bay. We lived in Berkeley to San Francisco where Imogen lived and she would always call up my dad and say, Ron, I've got a new camera. You've got to come over. I, I want to ask you some questions. So we'd pop in the car and drive over. And so it was quite fun um, to be amongst this world. As a teenager, I did um, uh, work as an assistant for Imogen. Th there's a funny little <coughs> process called spotting prints, which you now do in Photoshop very easily. But then you did it with a very, very fine brush and India <coughs> type ink, removing like white, little white spots off of prints. So I got to know Imogen pretty well during that time because we would have lunch together and work four or five hours in a day, and so it was a, it was a good um, it was a good exposure for me to see her in her work and her world um, as a teenager, which I hadn't done before um, that time period. But uh, to go back a little bit, Imogen. Uh, lived from 1883 to 1976. She lived 93 years, a good long life, and she determined to become a photographer when she was a teenager. So she actually had about 70 plus years as a working photographer. And the wonderful connection to the Northwest is she was born in Portland, but raised primarily in Seattle on Queen Anne when it was a, a wooded hill. And her father was, he called himself a humanist and a theosophist. And um, he did little jobs to make a living, grading roads, a uh, variety of things. But he was a very well-read man and he encouraged Imogen to um, go to college. So she went to the U University of Washington and already determined to become a photographer, she actually uh, enrolled as a chemistry major because that was the closest thing she could get to photography. After she graduated, um, she uh, went to the Curtis studio and uh, was taking over for a girl who was pregnant and uh, for three months and it, she didn't come back and so she's Imogen stayed for two years and learned platinum printing. So that was Imogen's introduction to the world of uh, photographers and working photographers. The one other thing she did uh, educationally that was formal was uh, because there was a man by the name of Kuhn, K-U-H-N, German, who worked for um, Curtis in the darkroom. He uh, encouraged Imogen to go to Dresden to study uh, platinum printing, and so Imogen did. And so she studied platinum printing for a year in Germany, and then came back to Seattle and opened a portrait studio in 1915. So she was very much based in the Northwest. So let's talk a little bit about the prints. Um, there are two techniques of photographic printing here. We have what's called a silver gelatin print, and this is common to all of us. We all grew up in the era where you go in the darkroom and you make a print. That would probably have been a silver gelatin print, now that Kodak is no longer in their you know, uh, historic uh, line of work. Um, we don't get as much of this, and we're all doing digital work now, but, or many of us, but uh, silver gelatin print was the primary technique for printing prints in the last, say, 80, 100 years, uh, until very recently. 
when Imogen learned platinum printing in the 19 zeros, um, she was doing a process that was very common at that day. Oh, there's probably two dozen or more different techniques of making an image photographically that we have passed through. Uh, wonderfully now, we are back into a stage that we'll, you'll hear about of a lot of people making different, now we're calling them alternative process work in different historic processes. But platinum printing is still alive and well, and this is a, a good example of one. Um, this is Roy, my grandfather. So this is a platinum print, and what that is, is it's a print that has not silver as the emulsion and gelatin, but it has platinum, which is, as we might all know, a noble metal. So it doesn't degrade, it doesn't corrode, it doesn't transform itself over time. It always stays as its own entity, as its own, in, in its own chemical state. Um, it is a, it's a process that was developed in the mid-1800s, actually, and it's one of the most archival processes still and it has a real warmth and a real tonality to it. The interesting thing about platinum is that it's put directly on the, the platinum emulsion, which you literally paint on by hand, is put on this, the paper you choose. So you, you go into your paper drawers, you take a piece of paper out, and you paint the emulsion on, unlike a silver print where you go buy a Kodak box or an Ilford box or an Agfa box, and it's all made for you. This you make yourself, and it's a con this is a contact printing process in which you put the negative right on the paper of, that you made, the platinum paper, and you expose it. We could, we could do it simply with, if I, if I had the chemistry here, I could make it in five minutes, take it out in the sun, and put it in a, a little a tray of water and make a platinum print. It's that simple. And it's also that complicated because you could spend 50 years getting really good at it. <laughs> it's one of those amazing things that is just endless in terms of the learning curve. And you can do it over and over with the same negative? Yes, you can use the same negative because over and over. No, as long as you do it properly. In other words, don't put it on wet platinum. Um, it, it's oh. corrosive, actually, when it's... Um, in a wet state. Uh, the Briefly, uh, photography has, it has a, a metal that we see, silver, and it has a sensitizer. And the sensitizer is what converts that metal so that we can transform it into the image that we see. So the sensitizer for platinum is a ferric based iron, ferric sensitizer. Then you take it, you wash it, and basically whenever we take a print, whatever the print is, we are removing that sensitizer and leaving the metals in the, the paper. So that's what we see. And uh, it's a, just a beautiful process that, strangely and wonderfully enough, it has twice the tonal range. In other words, twice the the amount of grays to, from black to white as silver does. But because it's right on a paper, and when you have a moment, you can take a look at it closely and see that it has kind of got a textured surface, and you're actually seeing the paper in that textured surface. With these, we have a, a gelatin layer where the silver is suspended in this very smooth layer of gelatin. So it's perfectly smooth and even. So that's the long answer to the question you didn't ask about the difference between silver and platinum. Imogen did both of these processes um, quite, uh, quite well and, and for a long period of time. She did platinum printing early in her career and not later in her career. Um, so Imogen moved to San Francisco in 1917, and uh, she was at that time 
um, married to Roy Partridge, and Roy was an etcher from Centralia, who, whose family moved to Seattle. Um, and they had three, three sons. Um, at the time that they moved to California, Imogen was pregnant with my dad, who was a twin. So Imogen had one son, and here the, is a photograph of the twins, um, right here, which is really lovely. Um, this is when they were like a few years old, and this is in California. So, so Imogen moved to San Francisco in uh, 1917, and Roy and stayed, and Roy got a job teaching um, at Mills College. So, uh, a lot of the work that Imogen did in the 20s and 30s was very um, much uh, a part of the Mills world. For example, this photograph here of Jose Limon. I'm, I know I'm making <laughs> the videographer work. <laughs> uh, this photograph of Jose Limon was taken at Mills College in the late 30s, but it's in their amphitheater. So uh, Imogen was really good at taking whatever her situation was and making the best of it. Um, and I think a lot of these photographs uh, behind the scenes share that kind of information. This, for example, was taken because she was a faculty wife at Mills College and she had a lot of these wonderful artists come through, which she asked to pose for and, and who posed for her. And uh, so she was able to capture some incredible people. And she was not shy about asking um, people to, to pose for her. Um, uh, these early photographs of the kids were taken because she had, as she said, three children in two years. <laughs> and what could I do, she said. <laughs> well, she, she did pretty well. She photographed these beautiful photographs of her, her kids growing up and um, also started her botanical work. So the photograph of the magnolia blossom outside that's for sale is, is an example of a photograph in 1925. So her kids were uh, eight and 10, and she wasn't really able to get out of the house and, and have a formal commercial studio. So she um, took a lot of interest in, in botanical work and and did a lot of botanical work at that time. Um, the one thing that Imogen did that's quite interesting is that she never hired people to pose for her. All of these photographs are people who are friends of hers or um, people who she met, like Jose Limon, I'm looking around, or people who she just ran into literally in the street or called up and asked if she could photograph. But she didn't, she paid one person once apparently to pose for her, and um, it was in 1910, I think. But after that, she just used the, the people and the, and the relationships she had to, to, um, to work with her in front of her camera. And I think that's very indicative. So I thought maybe what we could do is go around and talk a little bit about a few photographs because it's so much about who Imogen was. So this photograph is a photograph of Edward Weston. Edward Weston was a pretty well-known photographer and he lived in Carmel the later part of his life. He was a really good friend with Imogen, I think they ha you can see that relationship, you know, just, you can see that she, she took photographs of her friends and they were just so honestly there for her. Um, he actually, Edward Weston, Ansel Adams, and Imogen, Ansel <laughs> Adams, <Yeah. laughs> thank you, <laughs> and Imogen were all good friends, photographers, and they co-founded with a few others, lesser known photographers in the San Francisco Bay Area, 
F64. It's called Group F64. There's actually a whole book on it by Mary Allender that came out last year. Quite interesting. But I think it was, it was just a casual group of photographers who wanted to get together to exhibit their work. And now it's kind of put in on this pedestal of, of history that it was a big moment in time. And I think we define it as a moment in time, but it was one of those many things that happens between artists. And this was a very successful one. And they did a good job of it, but it's also been kind of um, canonized in a funny way. Um, but very, um, very helpful for the history of photography because what they were trying to do, this was 19, early 1930s, is they were trying to say, we are not pictorialists. We are not soft focus. We are looking at images through a lens in a sharp, long depth of field way. And actually, F64 is short for f-stop, which is the opening in the aperture that is the smallest opening in the aperture of that day and in a camera, which is the way you am allow a certain amount of light in. But the effect of the f-stop is that the smaller the aperture, the higher the number, 64, the greater the depth of field. So they were saying, we have great depth of field. We have great sharpness in our images. And we are defining ourselves by that purview into the world of photography. As an example of something else, this is Imogen in the 1910s. And here she is photographing her friends, Claire and John Butler. Um, and she used a large format camera. The negative was about this big. But the lens was a soft focus lens. In other words, it was constructed to diffract the light. And you know, like when you get out of a swimming pool, everything's a little soft and fuzzy. It was, it was created to diffract the light and, and make um, prismatic um, highlights out of the highlights themselves. And, and actually, Imogen was quite the pictorialist in the 1910s. And she would go out into the woods with her friends, and um, they would pose for her in, in either these wild, wonderful, sort of flowing costumes or nude. And she was um, naming these prints after um, different pictorialist writers of the day and, and other people who had influenced her. Um, to be inspired to, to pose her friends in this way. So she sort of went full circle. And the interesting thing about what Imogen did was, although she was a member of and a co-founder of Group F64, which was this defining kind of moment in the history of photography, but it was sort of a loosely casual group of its day, was that she consistently did her own work and, and, and pursued not just sharp focus, but her own kind of vision of what she wanted in a photograph, despite the parameters of what people said was the current thing to do. For example, um, the photograph out here that we have for sale is called Phoenix um, Dreamwalking. Dream it's called Dreamwalking, and it's a, a portrait of uh, a woman who is a girlfriend of Imogen's assistant. Her name was Phoenix. And what Imogen did was, Imogen was driving to Northern California, and um, she was with her assistant and Phoenix, the girlfriend of the assistant. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's got that little class hook on it. But that would be great if you could just move it off. So Imogen was was driving to Northern California, and they stopped at a Safeway to get some food. And um, she looked in the back of the Safeway parking lot, saw this great scene, and she wanted to put Phoenix nude in this great scene. But she was in a Safeway parking lot. <laughs> so what to do? Well, what she did was, when she got um, somewhere, 
that was a little quieter and had a dark background, she took Phoenix and photographed her nude against a dark background. It's a very common, simple technique. And um, then she came into the back home in the dark room and she put the image of Phoenix right, atta right sandwiched in with this image of this great view from the Safeway parking lot. And so this double exposure, which they're not being very successful about getting off the wall, which is a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, can't walk off it. <laughs> can't walk off um, it's, it's sort of a result of how image and thought. She would do anything she needed to get the image she wanted. She was very casual about that because um, some people were very defined about doing things just the right way. Oh, thank here's you. Phoenix. So here's Phoenix. And there's, there's the uh, background of, you can see why it was so tempting to, of Imogen to, to want to photograph this background. But uh, the Safeway parking lot was not quite the spot to put Phoenix nude in. <laughs> so that's just one example of how, how Imogen really worked very creatively her whole life. Um, Many photographs here uh, were taken of friends. This is, um, this is Al Lanier. Al Lanier was married to Ruth Asawa. Ruth Asawa is getting wonderful notoriety now as an artist. She died a few years ago. She made these beautiful uh, wire sculptures. They're now being, she's now being represented by a very internationally uh, astute uh, gallery in New York City. And they were good friends. And this was just a casual moment that, that Imogen caught. Um, I actually love the placement of these two, because this is uh, Ruth's uh, uh, painting in the background. And this is Roy's etching in the background. And there's, there's a wonderful uh, communication that goes on there. Um, in the black book, um, let me get that if I could. I, um, I put this together because it's so, uh, I, I was inspired by you all. Because <laughs> it's so hard to think, oh my gosh, you know, every one of these photographs has a story. Many I know, some I know a, a little about, and some like this, I know a lot about. But um, Imogen was uh, interviewed several times. And so oftentimes, she would be asked about specific work or photographs or technique. And wonderfully, we have a lot of information about it. So in this book, I have um, the information about either the artist or information about the, um, the quotes that Imogen uh, made in various interviews about specific photographs. Because I thought, you know, I can't possibly in a half an hour walk around and tell you all the stories that I know about these, as tempting as it is. <laughs> but um, there is a lot of uh, little bits of information in here about, about the work or about the artist um, or about the times or the technique. Um, so there are a few others that maybe we could talk about that, um, that might have, can I give that to you? Thanks. That, that might have some resonance with people. And um, might, people might wonder a little bit about what the history of these are. This is uh, called My Father at 90. This is Imogen's dad. And it was in, uh, Imogen's dad moved from Seattle to the northern part of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and um, this is him in uh, Northern California. And he was uh, 90 years old, and he had just chopped all that wood <laughs> by hand. <laughs> he was a sturdy fellow. <laughs> so, um, and he lived a very, very simple life. So Imogen often photographed him. Here's another photograph. Um, this one in platinum, of, of his, her dad. Uh, his name was Isaac Burns Cunningham. 
and this is when he was 60. So, interestingly enough, you know, you can see the age change, but it didn't, didn't look as dramatic as I would have thought. Yeah, he looks 90 here. <laughs> yeah. um, this is um, what one of our wonderful Northwest people. This is uh, Morris Graves, and it's called Morris Graves in his leek garden. And uh, this was in Northern California. Imogen taught workshops in Humboldt, at, at Humboldt State. Mm -hmm. And so she, whenever she went anywhere, she was amazing. She kept track of so many people. She kept track of people from the time she was in Dresden um, to the time she died, writing them back and forth and visiting rarely, but every few decades, and descendants of these friends of hers. So she would be in contact. We, we have several photographs of um, Morris in, in various, various dates from the 50s to, to later. Here's another photograph of him. Um, this is a double exposure um, in Northern California. It's, it's a very beautifully um, executed print of him. And his um, place in the country here in Northern California was called the lake. He called it the lake. And there was a large lake there that um, he apparently adored. And so this is sort of appropriate for his interests. And of course, really appropriate for Imogen's approach. So this um, is another artist, James Broughton, writer. And um, Imogen um, said, well, you know, it was really funny. I moved the camera, not him. <laughs> Meaning that she took the camera, and he was sitting there, and he was looking one way, and then she moved the camera, and he just happened to look the other way. So, <laughs> so this is, it is cool. And this is actually on one sheet, uh, one, not sheet, but one uh, exposure of her two and a quarter negative. So what she did was she took the cam she took the shot, actually, she took the shot. <laughs> she used a roll of flex, so she looked down. She took the shot, and he moved his eyes, and then she took the shot again. All she did not do is advance the film. Mm -hmm. And in these older cameras, it was very easy to make double exposures. You didn't have to do any tricks like, oh, move it backwards, it would automatically advance. No, no, no. <laughs> you had to advance it yourself. So if you didn't advance it, you <laughs> all, all, all beginning cool. students made many double exposures in, <laughs> in those days. <laughs> But it's, it's really great. And you know it was one of those happy accidents, as she would say. Um, the other thing that you can see beautifully on this wall is that um, these three photographs here, um, for me, are very much a part of how Imogen saw. This is a blind sculptor, and Imogen loved hands, and loved artists, and loved photographing artists and hands. And so here was a sculptor with his hands, and the sculptor piece with the hands, beautiful. This, of course, is another sculptor, and um, Imogen captured that moment so beautifully. And Stan, uh, this is 1959. Um, this is a beautifully sort of quiet moment that Imogen captured. Obviously, it wasn't posed pose, but it was waited for, you could say. So it, these three really, for me, say something about how Imogen kind of just tried to focus in on somebody and focus in on their hands and, and their work. Um, so. That's the whirlwind tour. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, yeah the, uh, there's this wonderful brochure that Danielle designed. And um, it is free. Uh, and we have a little donation box. If somebody wants to donate a dollar or two dollars, it costs about a dollar twenty-five to make it. So, um, but the brochure is free, and we have lots of them, so people are welcome to take one with them. If they want to donate a little, 
we won't say no. <laughs> the, um, there's some great quotes, and it has this insight as our curatorial statement. So why we chose her lens on the men of her time and the overall you know, conceptual flow of the show. Uh, so there's a box that we have quite a few of these. There's a box under the counter in here, um, in the hallway counter, and it's labeled, so feel free to take them out. Um, the, 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 they're banded together, and the top tends to be kind of scuffed up, so go ahead and recycle those and then take those out. Um, and then I, just, I also wanted to bring up real quick that um, if you guys notice, yeah. there are numbers, and um, it, we decided instead of labeling, it's such, we love the rhythm of the show visually, how it came together, so we didn't want the extra labels. So I have about seven of these printed out and laminated that people can walk around, and also all the information is here. But it's the title, who each person is, and if it's silver gelatin, or are the Yeah. And in the year. Um, yeah. So let us know if you run out of these or... And one other thing, and Craig, that thanks to you, you said in this entire room there is only one commissioned photo. And no. you can guess which one it is. <laughs> mm. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> 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 it's quick. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, it's true. Well, it's, does it say in the thing? No. 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 The, oh, this is the pop yeah. quiz for oh, just oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, I did want to say that actually this exhibit is extremely unique in that I don't think there's ever been an exhibit of Imogen photographing men throughout her life um, that has ever been curated uh, for Imogen before as a solo show. And it's thanks to these two, Danielle and Barbara, who came up with this brilliant idea in the archive as we were pulling the drawers open and going, let's see what we're going to do here. <laughs> and they, they've conceived this whole presentation curatorially. And it's thanks to them that we have such a beautiful view of Imogen's world and here. here. going on to the Getty. It, it um, is in another transformation. Yeah, they they, they, they have their own curators. They're very oh, okay. they're yeah, very clear they about that to me. Well, <laughs> they can probably get, get a few tips from these guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank so you. yes. Thank you very much.